اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم جمعی و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ ویلکم تو امام حسین اسلامک سینٹر اینڈ ایز آلویز اٹس این آنر اور پریولیج اینڈ اے پلیجر ٹو ہوسٹ ایوری باڈی ہیئر دس ایوننگ ویدر یو جوائننگ اس ان دی اوڈینس ہیئر لائیو اور ویدر یو جوائننگ اس آن لائن فرسٹ آف آل اپولوجیز وی ہیڈ اے فیو ٹیکنیکل ایشوز وتھ وتھ سم ٹیربل ایکو اینڈ ساؤنڈ دیٹ دیٹ prevented us from getting online on time. So I apologize, we're 15 to 20 minutes late and I apologize for that. Inshallah, we'll make it up with the excellent quality of the program with our two fantastic scholars and help from our very helpful and wonderful Lizzie who, is, who will do the Auslan for this evening. A brief agenda for this evening is that we will have a recitation of the Holy Quran as we do with the, at the beginning of every program. We'll have Ziyad Ali Asin, and then we'll commence the main part of the program, which is the importance of khums and zakat. And without giving too much away, we'll get into the detail of all of that very, very shortly. If you would, with your best and warmest salawat, please welcome Brother Ali Murhi for recitation of the Holy Quran, followed by Ziyarat. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لا الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومن والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون إن الذين كفروا سواء ختم الله على قلوبهم وعلى سمعهم وعلى بصارهم غشاوة ولهم عذاب عظيم ومن الناس من يقول آمنا بالله وباليوم الآخر وما هم بمؤمنين Oh, 
وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى على محمد وعلى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سلام على آل ياسين السلام عليك يا داعي الله ورباني يا تين السلام عليك يا باب الله وديان دينه السلام عليك يا خليفة الله وناصر حقه السلام عليك يا حجة الله ودليل إرادته السلام عليك يا تالي كتاب الله وترجمانا السلام عليك في آناء ليلك وأطراف نارك السلام عليك يا بقية الله في أرضه السلام عليك يا ميثاق الله الذي أخذه ووكده السلام عليك يا وعد الله الذي ضمنا السلام عليك أيها العلم المنصوب والعلم المصبوب والغوث والرحمة الواسعة وعدان غير مكذوب السلام عليك حين تكون السلام عليك حين تكون السلام عليك حين تكرى وتبين السلام عليك حين تصلي وتقنوت السلام عليك حين ترقع وتشجد السلام عليك حين تهلل وتكبر السلام عليك حين تحمد وتستغفر السلام عليك حين تصبح وتمسي السلام عليك في الليل إذا يخشى والنهار إذا تجلى السلام عليك أيها الإمام المأمون السلام عليك أيها المقدم المأمون السلام عليك بجوامع السلام أشهدك يا مولاي أني أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله لا حبيب إلا هو وأهله وأشهدك يا مولاي أن عليا أمير المؤمنين حجته والحسن حجته والحسين حجته 
وعلي بن الحسين حجته ومحمد بن علي حجته وجعفر بن محمد حجته وموسى بن جعفر حجته وعلي بن موسى حجته ومحمد بن علي حجته وعلي بن محمد حجته والحسن بن علي حجته وأشهد, وأشهد أنك حجة الله أنتم الأول والآخر وأن رجعتكم حق لا ريب فيها يوم لا ينفع نفسا إيمانها لم تكن آمنت من قبل أو كسبت في إيمانها خيرا وأن الموت حق وأن ناكرا ونكيرا حق وأشهد أن النشر حق والباث حق وأن الصراط حق والمرصاد حق والميزان حق والحشر حق والحساب حق والجنة والنار حق والوعد والوعيد بهما حق يا مولاي شقيا من خالفكم وسعيدا من أطاعكم فاشهدوا فاشهد على ما اشهدتك عليه وانا ولي لك بريء من عدوك فالحق ما رضيتموه والباطل ما استخدموه والمعروف ما املتم به والمنكر ما نهيتم عنه فنفسي مؤمنة بالله وحده لا شريك له وبرسوله وبأمير المؤمنين وبكم يا مولاي أولكم وآخركم ونصرتي معدة لكم ومودتي خالصة لكم آمين آمين صل على محمد وآل محمد Ahsan, Brother Ali, thank you very much. Inshallah, we, keep, we continue to keep hearing your beautiful voice and your fantastic efforts. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A couple of quick brief points on the agenda for this evening and the program, and inshallah, we'll continue with, uh, with the main part of it. Uh, tonight, we have a fantastic discussion with uh, Sheikh Muhammad Mahdi and Sheikh Mansur Lagai about uh, the importance of khums and zakat. These are two often poorly understood and sometimes overlooked subjects or topics that we face in the community and, and in our lives today. And it's an important thing uh, that we need to remind ourselves about, about our obligations and about our duties, especially in the financial sense. Um, so we'll get more into we'll we'll get into more of the details as we go along, but if I can request that uh, children four uh, from the ages of four to thirteen, please head on outside. There are some classes for you, so if you can head outside, like uh, my two wonderful brothers at the back there, uh, ages four to thirteen, we have some classes there. Yep, that's right. You heard it. I know you heard it because I saw you look at me. Yep. Classes outside for you, brothers. Thank you very much. Please head out uh, and join the classes, ages 4 to 13. All children ages 4 to, 4 to 13, please head outside for the classes. That also gives the uh, adults who remain in the hall uh, more of an opportunity to discuss uh, this very uh, detailed and very serious topic in more depth and a lot more freely as well. And it gives our scholars a chance to reply in that same kind of detail and depth uh, too. So thank you very much. Uh, next Friday night, there is no program next Friday night. Uh, so inshallah, you have uh, enjoy your evening off. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that there will be a few of us at the center anyway. If you really feel that you can't live away from the center for a, for a Friday night, I'm sure that there will be some of us here anyway. So. Inshallah, we will, uh, if not see you next week, then uh, definitely the week after, inshallah. 
Um, without further ado, inshallah, we'll, we'll continue with the program itself. Now, we have, uh, there is an opportunity for members who are uh, present here with us to ask any questions as we go along. And uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand uh, and we will get to your question as, as quickly or as soon as possible, inshallah. There is also an opportunity if you're watching on Facebook or you're watching on uh, YouTube, uh, you may also post your question there and inshallah we'll get to that as well. Uh, if you have uh, the WhatsApp number for the center, you're welcome to send your question there and, uh, and, uh, and we'll do our best to get to that also. Uh, we have, um, when we announced this program, we did give people the opportunity to send in any questions that they might have or um, like any parts of this subject or topic that you might like to have addressed in. And we have a number of questions, some of them very much in depth and detail uh, that we will go through as we progress. But in order to give ourselves an uh, introduction to the subject tonight, um, there is an ayah on the uh, on the poster and the advertising that we sent out. And, and for those of you like me who are not native Arabic readers or speakers, I'll give you the best translation I possibly can um, from, uh, from, uh, from a noted translation. Zakat expenditures are only for the poor and for the needy and for, for those employed to collect zakat and for bringing hearts together for Islam and for freeing captives or slaves and for those in debt and for the cause of Allah and for the stranded traveler an obligation imposed by Allah and Allah is knowing and wise. So the fact is that zakat and charity is referred to uh, very specifically in the Holy Quran. And with that introduction, I'd like to welcome uh, our two esteemed and beloved scholars, Sheikh Muhammad Mehdi, who's here with us this evening, and of also Sheikh Mansour Lagai, who's joining us via Zoom as well. Assalamu alaikum to you both. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you, Sheikh Mansour, for joining us as well. I know that uh, I do apologize once more that we had a few technical difficulties with uh, a few things going on, and we're a little bit delayed this evening, but inshallah, we'll get to the meat of the program um, straight away. Um, for everybody here this evening and everybody watching online, there are some questions that we will uh, go through to introduce this subject of Khums and Zakat to uh, similar but very different um, requirements when it comes to uh, obligatory charity and obligatory giving. I'll just find my note. Okay, so uh, if I can begin with uh, Sheikh Mansour, if you don't mind. Um, Sheikh, can you give us, just briefly talk about what is khums and what is zakat, please? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Firstly, once again, salam alaikum, hajali, Sheikh Muhammad, all brothers and sisters, in-house, out-house, virtually, really, and, and uh, everybody. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadi alawla an hadana Allah. Khums and zakat are uh, part of Islam's and not only Islam, all divine religions of uh, caring and sharing. Part of the homes and zakat is for physical needs of disadvantaged members of the community. And part of it is also for the spiritual needs of the community that we speak about. Promotion of Islam, preaching, teaching, educating the community and all these things. The notion behind collection of homes and zakat in Islam basically is that those who are more advantages in terms of financial uh, income, they uh, care and share their wealth with those uh, that are more disadvantaged. There are numbers of ayat in the Quran about this, about the wisdom of it and the rabayat. Inshallah, as we go through the discussion, if need be, I will touch on and explain it. So this is just in a nutshell for now. Asad Sheikh, um, where, where is it documented or where is it written or do we have a hadith about um, Khums and zakat, uh, uh, and the fact that it must be paid. Uh, where can we, where, where, if I wanted to look up a reference, where, where would I be looking? As for the homes, both of them are mentioned in the Quran and, of course, in numerous uh, prophetic narrations as well. 
As for the Quran, the ayah is in for the homes is in Surah Al-Anfal. Audhu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Fa'lamu anna ma ghanim tum min shay fa anna lillahi khumusahu wa lil-rasul wa lil-qurba. The rest of the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lo and behold, this is something that you need to know and you need to believe. That anna ma ghanim tum, whatever that you have earned, فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ Exclusively within this لِلَّهِ It means for the sake of God. That's why our Fagaha, they say that paying homes and zakat is a worshiping act. In as much as when you are praying and fasting, you make the intention of nearness to God. For paying homes and zakat, you need to make intention of nearness to God. It's not just paying the tax that you don't have to do. The intention must be for the sake of God as a worshiping act. فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ to God belongs its fifth, one twentieth of the uh, the income through the details that we'll discuss in our prayer. Finally, Allah Khumsa, wale Rasul, wale Dil Qurba, and then also the for for Allah, for the Prophet, and for the Imams. This is what the first half of the homes that we usually refer to as Sahm al Imam, because at the time of the Prophet, it belonged all to the Prophet as the head of the Muslim community. And at the time of any of the Imams, it belonged to the uh, head of uh, the, the Shia community, Muslim community, which was the existing Imam. And during the time of the major occultation, like our time, it will be uh, controlled and it's in the hand of uh, the representatives of the present Imam Sahib Zaman, who are our esteemed Maraja. And then the Quran says, Wal Yatama Wal Masakin Wabn Sabil, that are the poor and the needy and the orphans and those travelers, wayfarers, that they don't have the means to reach their home, on the condition that they all paternally related uh, to the Holy Prophet, as is the details that we discuss in in, uh, in fair. That's for the homes. For the zakat, there are numerous ayat in the in the Quran in general speaking about the zakat. And particularly the one that speaks about the obligation of zakat is mentioned in Surah Al-Tawbah, خُدْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَغَةً تُزَكِّيهِمْ وَتُطَهِرُهُمْ بِهَا That this was the first time the ayah was revealed in Medina, telling the Prophet that now the obligation of collecting the zakat has been revealed. So take the zakat from them to purify them. In fact, the term zakat for your information, literally it means to, to make it grow. I usually give this example that when you are trimming a tree uh, in, in your backyard, maybe your son is watching and says that, that why are you cutting some of the branches? It seems that you are cutting some branches of your tree, but you know that you make and you let the tree grow better and neat and nicer. Zakat is like this. By giving part of your wealth uh, for the sake of God, you are actually making your, your wealth uh, to flourish better and more and purer. Sheikh, is that this, uh, similar to giving charity where, uh, where um, in the giving of charity, sadaqah, uh, is said to increase your income or increase your wealth? Yes, very good. First of all, I need to mention, Haj Ali, because we, uh, the ayah that I recited in Surah Tawbah about zakat, you notice that the ayah did not use the term zakat. said sadaqah, khud min amwalihim sadaqah. One thing, all brothers and sisters, you need to be aware of, and there's usually a common uh, misunderstanding here, and that is in every human language, in Arabic, English, and every language, language is a very dynamic uh, and it, it's the processing things. It, it de develops and, and changes. So the words that are used in Arabic 1400 years ago at the time of the revelation of the Quran may not be necessarily the same, having the same meaning as they do today. One of the examples is zakat. Zakat, as used in the Quran, has a different meaning, or not exactly different, but has kind of a different meaning than what we use today in our jurisprudence. In our jurisprudence today, that usually people they, they think of when we think of zakat is the jurisprudential meaning of zakat that is specified in our prayer. Whereas zakat in the Quran is an, an umbrella term to include any type of donation, charity, or anything that you do for the sake of God. In fact, it does not have to be fiscal. Quran and the Ruwayat often they use the term zakat for spreading knowledge, for uh, the zakat of your status, the zakat of your knowledge, the zakat of your wealth, or anything it is. Don't think when you are reading the Quran about the zakat, don't think about the jurisprudential meaning of it. 
Zakat in the Quran in general includes what we call today sadaqah, charity. It includes uh, jurisprudential zakat. It includes homes. It includes enfaq fi sabillah, spending in the way of God. It includes anything that you do for the sake of God. So someone is spending some time volunteering at the Mount Hussein Islamic Center. This also is zakat or a zakat as well. So yes, the answer is that anything that is promised for the zakat includes charity that we refer to as today as sadaqe, homes, enfaq, voluntary work. All of the rewards that are mentioned for zakat uh, includes all of these as well. Hassan, thank you, Sheikh. So the uh, the term as you said the term in the Qur holy quran when zakat is used it's an overarching term that refers um uh to so many different aspects and types of zakat is that right that's very correct okay. and one of the proofs for that is that you see when you read the quran from the very early time that the holy quran was revealed to the prophet in early days of uh, the prophetic mission of the prophet for example, take the example of Surah Al-Muzzammil, which is among the very first uh, uh, chapters of the Quran revealed to the Prophet. God is talking about aqimu uh, salat wa atu zakat, establish the prayer and uh, give the zakat as well. Everybody agrees and knows that in early days of Islam, there was no obligation of zakat, yet the term zakat is used. That shows that zakat in the Quran is not just for the jurisprudential zakat. Zakat in the Quran means anything that you do for the sake of God, fiscal or otherwise. Awesome. So, Sheikh, when did it first become an incumbent on people to pay the zakat uh, in, any, in any of the forms that you've mentioned? And uh, that leads us on to a few other questions, but if you can answer that one, then inshallah I'll ask the rest. Historically, it was the second year after the moderation of the Prophet that the ayah that I just recited, Qud min amwalihim sadaqa, was revealed to the Prophet. So that means 15 years after the advent of Islam, the obligation of zakat was revealed. And interestingly, the term used in the Quran for the obligation of the zakat is sadaqa. Qud min amwalihim sadaqa. In other ayat that specifies the use of the, sadaqa, the zakat, also Quran says, innama sadaqatu lil fuqarate wal masakin. Do you see? So the, the terminology of the Quran for jurisprudential zakat is sadaqa. Whereas today, when we say sadaqa, we mean uh, mustahab charity. I see. Okay, thank you, Sheikh. It's not, um, hopefully it will become a little bit clearer as we go on. Um, but uh, can I ask, um, you've mentioned when it was first, when it first became incumbent on people to pay. Um, is it still relevant today? And uh, who does it apply to? The jurisprudential zakat? Yes, Sheikh. Yes, jurisprudential zakat applies mainly to uh, people because the uh, zakat applies on the farmers, whether they have cattle, livestock, or they have uh, like farms of wheat, barley, uh, and, and wheat, barley, uh, raisin, uh, and date. These are the four items that are mentioned, as well as gold and silver. Today, zakat mostly applies to farmers, I must tell you that. If you are living in urban areas like in Sydney, most likely zakat is not applicable to you unless under the fatwa by Tullah Sistani who takes even oblig uh, obligatory precaution that zakat applies to your, uh, uh, the, the capital of your, uh, uh, your business as well. But other marajah, they say it's mustaha. Usually his followers, they go to other marajah to, to skip this uh, So in general, uh, obligatory zakat applies mainly to the farmers. So Sheikh, you've made an interesting point there about the farmers um, and with the commodities that you mentioned, such as wheat, barley, grains, et cetera, et cetera, and even um, gold and silver. If, um, if for example, I am uh, trading in commodities, which is quite, regular these days that uh, I'm not buying and selling commodities such as all of the ones that you mentioned for the sake of consumption or reselling but for the sake of trading and making a profit on the contracts rather than taking physical delivery etc etc then does that also apply to me as well 
No, zakat doesn't apply to you in that sense. Zakat applies only if you are the owner of the farm or the livestock uh, to certain details that is specified in Fayyad. Uh, but in that case that you are trading them, uh, homes applies to you. Okay, but that's only if, I'm, if, I've, if I've gathered wealth and made a profit at the end of uh, by, at my home state, yes? Of course, of course. Okay. So yes. if uh, for all you traders, want to be traders out there, uh, uh, I'm sure you're suffering a lot of losses at the moment, depending on what you're trading. Uh, you should listen in on, on these next few parts. Um, uh, I, I want to shift to Sheikh Mohammed and ask you, Sheikh. You were enjoying this, I know. <laughs> uh, Sheikh, um, you deal with a lot of people, especially in the, in the Australian community, people who have migrated here or grown up here or were born here. Um, could you comment on some of the community attitudes that you've come across when it comes to Khums and Zakat? We can hold it here, Shay. Firstly, um, we'll look at what's more general than what's more exclusive. Generally, um, due to the um, access of information and uh, disinformation, well, not only information, disinformation and the uh, the accessibility people have with the internet, people have become scholars themselves. <laughs> so Armchair scholars. Armchair scholars. <laughs> so they tend to derive rulings themselves. And this is for the whole world. We're not talking. And they get assistance from people that like to give their own opinions. Yep. And uh, when these people give their own opinions, they make people have doubt in the... Uh, ecclesiastical system, the yep. scholarly world, and people start doubting uh, the opinions of the monarchy. Yeah, I used to remember once the first time I actually, I was in my late teens, and someone mentioned something. This is before the YouTubers and, and all influencers the internet come and on. Yep. And someone had mentioned something about one of the representatives of one of the monarchy. So at the time, my father, Allah was still alive, and I said, "This person said this about this monarchy." representative my father said to me we are told by the messenger of God to give a believer 70 excuses he says what if the person is a scholar you should give him even more than 70 excuses mm -hmm. if a normal believer he gives 70 excuses the problem now when someone puts a doubt into someone's head automatically they refrain from making um, paying their, their dues now here's the problem and I've mentioned this before. I've met so many people that have waswas when it comes to wudu, when it comes to ghusl, when it comes to prayer. But I've never met someone with waswas when it comes to khums and zakat. <laughs> you know, they never have a problem when it comes to this department. Yeah. They'll always know that they don't have to pay. This is one of the biggest problems. There's a hadith where they ask the sixth holy imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, what is the quickest path to the fire of hell. And the Imam says, Man akala amwal al -yateem. The one that eats the amwal, the money, the wealth of the orphan. And then he says, Wa nahnu We are this orphan. So in other words, the one that eats the hukuk of the Imam, this is the quickest way into the fire of hell. So these Jews have to, and this is the problem that we have here in this country is people come up with their own opinions when it comes to khums. They think, okay, when it comes to paying, they'll tell you, oh, can I give this amount to a poor relative? And you say, hold on, you can give them from your own money. You know, this is meant to be given specifically and dealt with according to the way the marja'i says. So if someone, for example, gives you and says that I do taqlid of fulan, you know, can you send this to the office of Fulan? That's where it has to go to the yeah. office of the of the of the of the respective alam. And that's our biggest problem: is people are getting their opinions from anyone that sings the tune that they want to hear. Yes, unfortunately, that that there is a there is a, a problem in many 
in many beliefs, in many belief systems that, uh, that you, if you look far and wide enough, you'll find somebody to agree with your opinion and to give you the ruling that you're after. Mm. And unfortunately, we're not immune from that either. And, uh, and, but you can, you can smell a rat a mile away, I think, uh, oh, when, when, it comes to that, when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, the, is, is it safe to say that generally people um, are understanding and accepting of these decrees? In your, in your experience and what you've come across, or, is, or are they generally more skeptical? Look, the people with good heads on their shoulders mm. are generally more accepting of these ideas because they understand where the scholar is. Because if you think about it, when you um, look, for example, in Australia, we got Anzac Day, we got Remembrance Day, because they remember those that fought for the country, for yeah, example. Those who sacrificed. Sacrificed, yeah. and they look at it, these people are patriots, it wasn't for them, yeah. we want to be enjoying this freedom. One thing that they do in the Hausa, when they're teaching you, they'll open a book. For example, you are studying the Halakat for Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al They'll open the book, and they'll, the scholar teaching you will ask you to recite the Fatiha for Sayyid al for example. Why? Because... If it wasn't for this sacrifice mm. and his forbearing, enduring studies, you wouldn't have this knowledge. Yep. And all our books and all our lessons, although you know, you have some people that will say, I only believe in the imams, I don't look at the scholars. I say, okay, the words of the imams, they didn't come and fly into your lap. There were thousand and so years of ulama that carried these words and these studies and compiled books and memorized books, how often were our scholars fought against and silenced, you know, for years. And these people carried the lessons that you have at your fingertips today. So people understand this and they're, they're not ingrates. They have gratitude to the ulama and they understand. The other thing that is, is apparent is you look at all our ulama, how do they live? And if it was some institute like the Nation of Islam where Elijah Muhammad <laughs> had eight or nine mansions and a mistress in each yeah. mansion, yeah. come and talk. But look at how our, fuqaha, our scholars live. Mm. Like, for example, um, say the Sistani's house is a rented house mm. in, in Najaf. It's not even his own property. It's a rented house. Or when you go to um, Qab and you see the house of Imam Khomeini, who was the leader of a country, if you go there and you look at his house, then you compare it if you go to the palaces of Saddam yeah, in Iraq. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. And they were, they were both leaders at the same time. Um, if you look at all the fuqaha living today, and the way that they live, it's not like there's some person piling up all this money somewhere. <laughs> and it's actually a very big burden. Just to let you know, Sheikh um, Murtad al-Ansari, who was the who was the main marja of taqlid in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. They say he used to go into the shrine of Imam Hussain alayhi because they used to close it at night yeah. and he'd ask to be there by himself. And one day the keeper of the shrine looked inside, he said he saw him bending down and crying. And he was saying, Imam Hussain, please relieve this burden of my back. This burden of marja'iyya, it's so difficult. Mm. It's not like someone comes in and they fight for it. It's something where you're in that position, you're able to uh, extrapolate law. Mm. You have got that position. You have been entrusted with this. There's a great deal of responsibility. Yeah. I'm not saying you might, you might get some guy, a random guy that says he's a manager. You're going to get like a million yeah, people that come out of nowhere. Yeah. But the fuqaha that are known mm. and, and are entrusted with these, uh, people know them, people are around them. Uh, and, and we shouldn't listen to some rogue that has his own television station that decides to talk about the ulama, just, you know, whoever it is. Because these people, they're knowingly or unknowingly being supported by uh, those that want to destroy the establishment. Of course, of course. understood, understood. Sheikh, thank you for that, for that bit of brief background. I wanted to get into some of the questions that we've received already. And uh, 
uh, we, have, we have a number of questions that we've received from people throughout the week uh, in anticipation of this, um, of this session. Um, there are some that are really, um, really involved and very complicated, uh, and some that might be a little bit easier to understand and to digest. Um, let me start with uh, either yourself or Sheikh Mansour, um, Mansour. and uh, with the fatwa of Sayyid Sistani. Uh, Sheikh Mansour, if you, if you could uh, answer these next couple of questions, let me ask them and then you're welcome to, to answer them all if you wish. Uh, first of all, um, how do I calculate the khums for years? I have been unable to pay my khums, both for Sehme Imam and Sehme Sadat. And that's actually brought us on to an interesting uh, point. Uh, if you don't mind, could you preface that answer with the, the different types of khums payments, Sehme Sadat and Sehme <coughs> Imam, please, uh, Sheikh Mansour? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar Yes, I will answer that one, and uh, by all means, uh, anything comes to my mind, I will mention, and Sheikh Muhammad can uh, add to it, or vice versa, because uh, naturally I may forget something, or Sheikh Muhammad may respectfully, so inshallah we are here together to assist each other. For someone who has never paid homes in their life, and now they have become privy to, the, to this, and they want to pay the homes, there are different situations. Sometimes they know that they didn't have any savings, so homes never apply to them. Alhamdulillah, safe and sound. They don't need to worry about the past. Or they know that they have had saving and never paid homes out of whatever reason. Uh, the best way and the most practical, there are some precise methods of calculation, but I make it very easy for this uh, gathering. The easiest way, is to see whatever that they have uh, accumulated through the years, more than the last 12 months, they regard it as a saving and uh, deduct the homes of it. That is 20% of it. Sometimes they can afford it to withdraw 20% of their saving and give as a homes. Sometimes they don't have enough cash uh, to, to do so. So they speak with the representative of the manager and they make some arrangement for them so that they make their they pay their homes on installment until it is cleared and paid. Naturally, usually for people who've never paid homes, first time is a little bit a challenge because sometimes it's a big lump sum of money, but uh, then it will be all right and uh, will become more uh, easier to, to do it. In terms of Sahm Sadat and Sahm Imam, see homes, technically speaking, is divided into two main portions. One, we call it Sahm al-Imam, which will be given to the manager. Another one, Sahm al-Sadat, for the poor Sayyid, poor orphans and, and the like. According to Ayatollah Sistani, exclusively, otherwise, if you are following other marajah, you have to give the whole homes to the marajah, or you need the consent of your marajah. But uh, according to Ayatollah Sistani, if you know any poor Sayyid among your relatives, that they are not dependent on you for their income, for their expenses, like, for example, your sibling. Your sibling, you don't have any obligation to pay them, and if they are saying Or some relatives among, uh, you know, your, your family relatives, whether in Australia or overseas, and you know that they are poor. And the meaning of the poor is someone whose annual expenses, his, their annual genuine expenses is more than their annual genuine uh, uh, income. Categorically, they are always behind. Therefore, this person is poor, and is Sayyid, paternally related to the Holy Prophet. So from Sahm Sada, you don't need the permission of Ayatollah Sistani. Ayatollah Sistani already consented that, and you can give it to the poor Sayyid that you know of, if you know of. If you don't know, along with Sahm Imam, you send it to uh, the office of uh, your marja, in this case, for example, Ayatollah Sistani. But as for Sahm Imam, uh, the rule in general is that if you want to spend the homes yourself on any Islamic cause, or for the poor, you need the consent of your marja because the rawayat says that homes is leman sabel imama, is for the position of the, the head of the community. In this case, the marja. Uh, Ayatollah Sistani exceptionally says, for Sahme Sadat, I've already consented that to, to spend it. For Sahme Imam, either give it to me, or if you want to spend it on any Islamic cause, you need my consent. Awesome. Thank you, Sheikh. That was a, 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 you mentioned an interesting point in a roundabout way, which I was going to ask you about later on. 
and that is that um, the homes must be paid to the marja that you do taklid of. It is not something that I as an individual can make the decision myself to spend or pay in this manner, even though the intention is that it is going for homes. Is that is that a clear understanding? That's, that's very correct. Uh, kind of uh, brothers and sisters, they need to think of homes and zakat. Of course, I'm talking about obligatory zakat and homes. They need to think of it kind of like a tax that you give to the government. Yes, to certain level, the government may uh, give you exemption for certain uses if you are tax, the cause is a tax deductible cause, but they will not accept you, accept it from you to spend it as you wish to, for charity causes or anything. There is a structure, isn't it? The same for homes and zakat. It's kind of Islamic uh, tax system, kind of Islamic tax system, and therefore needs the consent of uh, the Imam Masum before that the Holy Prophet at the time of the Imams, Imam Masum, and at our time, the representatives of Imam Masum, which are esteemed marajah. So, thank you, Sheikh. Um, is there an easy way to uh, manage and calculate one's homes every year? Uh, for example, uh, do we need to do it at a particular date or a particular time? Is there something that is uh, more recommended or less recommended? Yes. Technically speaking, the first uh, pay slip that you get will be the beginning of your home sale. You need to specify your home sale, and I'll tell you that, inshallah, if you go through the discussion, I will uh, prove it that homes applies to almost all of us. If some people, they think that they're exempt from homes, if we discuss it, they will realize that, no, it's not the case. Everyone who has an income, kind of homes applies to them. So the first pay slip or the first income that I have that day, imagine like, for example, today, 17th of uh, June, was my first pay slip received. This is the beginning of my home sale. Now, I have two options. The easy option is that every time you receive your, your income, a uh, profit comes to you, deduct 20% of it, and, uh, and pay it off. Either pay it off, or I know certain individuals, they have an, another account. You can call it homes offset account, and uh, drop that money just withdraw it from the income, the immediate income that they have received now, and put it in their offset homes account, and wait for one calendar year. If throughout the year there was any emergency need for that money, by all means you can spend it, and it's part of your expenses. If one calendar year from that date passed, next year, 17 June 2023, and that money was not needed, or any amount of it was not needed, that means that's your homes and you deliver it to your marja. This is the easiest way of calculation. And I know individuals are usually recommended to people and this is a recommended way. No need to worry about calculation at the end of the day. I'm not sure I have to go through all my bank statements and everything. Any pay slip and any income you get, immediately withdraw 20% of it as homes, but keep it aside in case of emergency throughout the year if you, if you need it. And if you don't need it, inshallah, you will give it for the homes, and that easily shows that you have cleared your, your homes. This is as long as, your, as long as your income is concerned. There is another uh, uh, part of the homes that we need to pay, and that is when we buy uh, food items for home. This is the area that I said almost applies to everybody. It's very common that when you buy, you don't buy only for, for what you want to eat tonight. Unfortunately, it's become like this. People go shopping and have a bulk shopping, fridge and freezers are food, uh, painters are, are, are food. When your home here comes, also you need to go to the kitchen and check the food items. All the food items that you, are, you have there and are not used yet. Like for example, you bought 10 kilos sack of uh, rice, let's say two kilos of it is still uh, there. In the fridge, there are some food, fruit items left uh, as well. I don't know, pantry, there are some other items uh, there as well. Rough estimation, how much is the value of all of this that is left on the 17th of June, which is my home here per se, through this example I mentioned. I need to estimate the value of all the food items that I have and then deduct 20% of it as the homes of the food items left in my house. And this will be the homes of the food, extra food in my house. Sheikh, thank you. Um... Just to clarify further what you've, what you've said, or let me ask you a couple of questions on that. Uh, 
Kumps doesn't apply only to financial saving or what I've got in my bank account or the, uh, the cash that I have stashed under my mattress or anything like that. Uh, it applies to anything and everything that is unused or remaining for that particular year. Is that right? Um, yes and no. No, in the sense, like for example, there are things that in your house, in your business, that you uh, they are used and they are not finished. Like for example, you bought furniture for your house. There is, you are still using them and they are there. Yeah. There is no homes on it. The car that you have purchased and you are driving it, whether for for personal use or uh, business uh, purposes, you are still using it and it's not. Uh, there is no homes on it. On items that are are wearing out and finishing, like food items. Yes, there's homes on it, as well as the cash that naturally will be spent and uh, is expected to finish or save. Anything that was saved extra, whether food or, or money, then there's a home on it. Awesome. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, now, you mentioned that homes can apply to almost everybody. Um, what about children? Children who are, let's say, under 18, but might be, uh, might have already reached that age of taklif. Um, when they, let's say, you know, you, you, you have your son, your daughter, you give them something for their birthday, they save that money. Um, does, does the Qums apply to them as well? Yes, here again, the fatwa are a little bit different. According to the fatwa of Ayatollah Sistani, Homes applies even on children because majority, one of the conditions of uh, homes, they say because uh, a child under the age of Buluq is not uh, mature yet and therefore Buluq is a condition because he has not reached the age of uh, puberty. There is no obligation of homes on him as there is no obligation of Salat on him. Ayatollah Sistani, however, he says that homes applies on him, but because him or her, the child is a minor child, the guardian of the child, like the father, has the responsibility. If he knows that his son or daughter has a saving, then they need to withdraw the 20% of the saving of the child and give it as the homes. Awesome. So um, does that apply even if the saving is for a specific purpose? For example, uh, my 16-year-old son has started to save some money so that when he gets his license, he can buy a car or my wife and I have put some money aside so that we can afford a deposit to buy a house? Yes. First of all, for your information, Hajali, a 16-year-old boy, Islamically, uh, has reached the age of Bulu. Yep. So we are not talking about the, the legal age of consent, 18. So it's the age of Bulu, nine uh, lunar calendar for the girls and 15 lunar calendar for the, for the boys. Now, when a child, uh, per, so I bring the, the age a bit lower, if you don't mind, for the sake of the discussion. Let's say it's a 12-year-old boy and has some saving because he, they know that by the time they reach the age that they need to get a license. This is a very hypothetical example that you gave now because the age is 12. I don't think it applies. But let's say that he knows that at the time that he gets 18 and wants to have his license and, and drive a car, he cannot afford to buy a car there and then and start saving for that. If the car is a necessity for him then, and there's no any other way to have the car unless it start saving from now, according to Ayatollah Sistani, is part of the ma'une. Ma'une means the necessary uh, expenses, and therefore is homes exempt. Um, but if it's not necessary, and uh, it's possible for him to live without that, or it is possible uh, when he gets to that age, to finance or find some other uh, means of uh, securing or buying the, the car, then any saving, they will be home side. The same for the future education of the children. If there is no any other way to uh, support your son or daughter at the time that they go to the uni, for example, financially, unless you start saving from now, this saving is homes exempt. Otherwise, it needs to be homes. Asan, thank you, Sheikh. I think the so the rule, sorry, let me summarize. Please. The rule is that whether this saving is to cover a necessary expense that otherwise is impossible to pay at, at the time of that expense, or it is not a necessary expense. Okay, thank you, Sheikh. I think that, that summed it up, that clarified what I was about to ask next, so that, that's fine. But if I can ask uh, a different question, and uh, perhaps related, but slightly different. Um, 
one that's come through from, from somebody. Uh, let's say that uh, a person has um, put together an emergency saving fund, right? Uh, for argument's sake, $5,000. The idea is to never, uh, to, is to not necessarily use that money, but to have that money in case of an emergency, in case something happens, something goes wrong, um, suddenly you need some extra uh, money in your hand to be able to, um, to be able to meet those uh, urgent expenses or something. In many cases here, um, we have family overseas, uh, we may need to go and visit them, we have sick relative or sick parents that we may need to go and see or attend to or provide some financial help so that they can um, receive uh, health care or anything else. Does Homs also apply to that? All right. This is what we call it, Hajali Emergency Fund, like first aid. Yes. The first aid that you have in your kitchen, inshallah, you never need to open it, the, the box, but this is also an emergency fund. You keep it somewhere safe in case of any emergency, medical, travel, or otherwise. Uh, among the current maraja, the only one that I know of that has a fatwa that this is exempt from the homes is Ayatollah Makarami Shirazi. The rest of the maraja, they have this explanation as I will, inshallah, uh, explain it. They say that the, the, actually the reason that you are given permission to delay your homes to the end of the financial year is just in case of any emergency uh, situation comes up. Otherwise, it is recommended to pay your homes at the time of receiving your pay slip and, and your, your income, as we discussed it. However, Islam has allowed you to delay to the end of the financial year in case of any emergency needs throughout the year. Cover it from that money. You don't need to worry about paying the homes. But if no emergency arises at the end of the year, you pay the homes of it. Then you say that, well, I paid the home. And when you pay the homes, remember, still you keep one fourth of it with you. 80% of that fund still remains with you. You pay 20% of it. And then you keep it for the rest of your life. There is no home on it. So, for example, if I have 5,000 kept as an, uh, a part of my homes, but I don't pay it now in case of any emergency uh, uh, arises. I keep it until the end of the year. Then at the end of the year, alhamdulillah, no emergency came up. Pay 20% of it. How much I'm left with? Uh, 5,000. 4,000. Uh, 1,000 will be deducted. 4,000. Now, this 4,000, I can open another account and keep it as an emergency fund for the rest of my life. There's no homes on it ever again because it has been homes. You know that homes, unlike the government system, applies on uh, anything only once. So this 4,000, you can keep it for the rest of your life as an emergency fund. fund. Anytime you need it, you can withdraw it. Next year, again, something comes up, you can add to it as well. Over the years, your saving will be as much as you need for emergency fund will come up without worrying about uh, the home seduction. I mean. Asad Sheikh, I'm glad you mentioned that. That was going to be my next question, um, uh, that once, um, <clears throat> once an amount has, um, once you've paid homes on the amount, like in the example that you gave, that it's exempt from homes in the future again. Now. Yes. Um, I want to complicate it a little bit, and I'm, I apologize in advance for the complication. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm passing on to Sheikh Mohammed, don't worry. <laughs> um, and Sheikh Mohammed, I will come to you, don't worry. Yes, don't. <laughs> um, uh, Sheikh Mansour, that let's say I have that 5,000, one year passes, by the grace of God, I have no emergencies, I pay my homes on it, I have $4,000 left. The next year, I have some reason to spend some money out of that. Then I only have $2,000 left out of it. But I say, okay, well, I want to bring it up to, to $4,000 again because that's what I had before. And I have, alhamdulillah, I have the opportunity. I bring it back up to $4,000. <clears> Excuse me. Something stuck in my throat. Um, so I bring it back up to $4,000. Is Khums applicable to that amount again or not? Very, very good and common question, Hajali. The answer is not difficult. The answer is that you cannot compensate the loss of the previous years from the income of this year. But if it was the loss of this year, throughout your home year, within home year of this year, it is possible to compensate it. There's no problem with that. But I cannot say that five years ago, for example, my saving was 5,000, and four years ago, I, I lost, let's say, half of it. But now, alhamdulillah, this year I have gained. Can I compensate what I had lost three years ago, two years ago? 
نایه کنان payable again on the complete 4,000 or only the amount that I topped up? No, no, the amount that you have topped up. Okay, great. Only the amount that is topped up, yes. Okay, fantastic, that's, that's good. I hope, I hope that's clear. If there's any questions or anything, please, if there's any, uh, if you're not clear about any of the things that we're talking about, please do um, uh, raise your hand or, or, or uh, make it known and, and inshallah we can discuss it further or, or help clarify it for you. Um, <coughs> Sheikh, this is an interesting one. I might go to Sheikh Muhammad on this one, because uh, I know you'll enjoy this one more. <laughs> uh, Sheikh Muhammad, um, how can, okay, we're, we're paying lots of tax to the Australian government, and they do a good job of helping people in need over here. Uh, how do I, do I still need to pay my khums and zakat? Uh, you know, we, we, we live here, we earn here, we pay the taxes here. Should we be spending our homes and zakat for Australia and for Australians in need or for people overseas? Firstly, we, uh, we cannot hear Sheikh Mohammed. Maybe, so, maybe, maybe you should answer this here. Firstly, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we shouldn't mix um, the Australian tax system with with um, our arms system, you know, when the it reminds me of the um, the um, the Pharisees when they came to um, Jesus in the Bible, and they said, "Shall we give tribute unto Caesar?" And he says, and he responds to them by, "Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God's." And it's a biblical verse, and it's applicable. See, what you need to do here, what is with regard to Australian law, is separate to what is with regard to your obligations to God. Yeah. So you're paying your tax to the Australian government, leave that for the ATO yep. and your accountant to deal with. <laughs> As for the arms that you pay and the system and the way that it's used, you do not even understand the Australian system. So when you're paying money to the Australian government, okay, you don't even... Un if I was to pick everyone out here and ask them about the Australian budget, if I asked everyone here, how much money do we use for military expenditure last year's budget? Thank you. No one knows. Well, my, I'm looking at one person, maybe he knows, but... No, he doesn't. <laughs> the main person you're looking at doesn't know. No, he doesn't. I told you. <laughs> I told you he doesn't know. They don't know. See, because they trusted, and they trusted Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton, they trusted them. Yeah. But they don't trust Ali Khamenei and Ali Sistani for some reason. This is how the people are, <laughs> you know? This is a problem. When it comes to our systems, the Islamic systems, and the way that they are, people want to question because they say, hold on, I'm paying more money. Yeah. And the other thing is, it, and, and, and you, you're, not actually, you're not actually paying more money. You've got surplus, as Samah the Sheikh explained. You're not paying on, if you earn, say, listen, you earn $40,000 a year, and you spend $40,000 a year on your living expenses, then you don't pay any homes. The money is on surplus. Anything that's extra. Mm -hmm. And things that are necessities. And necessities doesn't mean food, war, shelter, and clothing. No, no, there's other things that are considered necessities. And Samah the Sheikh mentioned a car, for example. If the car is considered a necessity, you know, then that has that exemption. Now, why, what we're basically going over this question is something the Sheikh's already explained. Yeah. When you're giving it to the Marja'i, when you're giving the Khumas, because you, you need to remember the verse he mentioned in Surah Al-Anfal. Uh, it says, Falillahi, it says, firstly, Lillah, for Allah, is the Khumas. Khumasuhu, walil Rasul, walidil Qurba. And these first three, 
he mentioned uh, basically the Imam. Because Allah Azza wa Jal is not he collected the money. Yeah. Yeah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is not he to collect the money. It's the Imam. Now the Imam says about the ulama, hum hujjati alaykum. There's no one that has the exclusive right, but they are my proof to you. Mm -hmm. So they're my argument towards you. They're my representatives in this case, general representatives. So they're the ones that handle the Sahm al Imam. So Mahatma Sheikh also mentioned in these previously, we're going over these points, yep. that he mentioned for Sahm Sayyid, Sayyid Sistani is giving you that right to give it to poor Sayyids, but the others you need their. Yeah. Um, consent. Consent. Yeah. So they have this authority in this position. He also mentioned, I'm just going over points he mentioned, if, if you know, because they've been answered. <laughs> he said the taxation office doesn't give you, say, here's your tax, go put it in the right places. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then, then you know, I'd probably use all the um, taxation money to remove all the high rises, speed humps. <laughs> All the, other, all the things I don't like in this world, you know? Yeah. So I'll be using it for what I think is necessary, you know? And um, uh, the, these kind of things, because I'm going to use it to what I understand, whereas the alim has a more uh, vast uh, experience and understanding and, and he has more uh, insight into what the Islamic nation yeah. Requires. Yeah, it's like it's like having a view, <clears throat> for example, my very limited view of what's directly in front of me as an individual, yeah. versus somebody who's looking at the entire ummah and saying, "This is what the ummah needs, and this is where it needs to be spent, and mm. how it needs to be spent." So, I might only know five people or five issues that need assistance, mm. but those five, while they might be very important to me, might not factor in very highly when mm. you look at the overall picture and all of those issues or people in need. Mm. And that's where the Maraja have that view and that capability of, of looking at things. That's right. Sheikh, a related question uh, for you. Um, you mentioned about oversight. Mm. And uh, uh, in Australia anyway, there is very strict reporting about how much tax was collected, how it was spent, what the budget is, where it's going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard the comment, uh, comments from various community members about a situation with zakat and khums, about what are the mar maraja doing? How do we, forgive me for saying this, but how do we know that it's going to a particular place? How do we know that it's being spent for X, Y, or Z purpose? Well, Where's the reporting? Where's the transparency? Well, hold on. There is no transparency with the um, Australian government either. How often do you get a story where someone's been using it for personal trips and, and, and what have you? Every second politician, yeah. perhaps. Well, yeah. That's right. So you, there is no... Th that's farcical to begin with. There are so many... Even the campaigning, how much tax money are they using? But, but couldn't just, you argue that, that yeah, it is because of the reporting and because of the transparency that eventually it gets found out anyway? It gets found out when they're finished, their terms. <laughs> when they're right near the end. <laughs> conveniently. So w what I'm trying to say is this transparency... If, for example, I don't show uh, everyone... Uh, well, in my family, you don't show your children how you're budgeting things because yeah. it's none of their business. Yeah but they're getting fed and they're being looked after. Even the government doesn't show you everything. There are specific things that they let you know. See, if they might say we're using $2 billion for education, but it could be just to, um, you know, rub, chuck down the throats of the children, educating them into um, uh, sexual immorality. You know, that's what, they use. That's what yeah. it could be yeah. for. Could be. It could not be for, for literacy or numeracy. You don't understand what they're actually using it for. So we could give you this. But what we do in Islam, we actually tell you what it's used for. There is, it doesn't say we use this much billion for that or that. No, no. Because it's not even in the billions. But what it's actually used for, it's used for strengthening your religion. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the Islamic seminaries, how are they run? And yeah. mind you, the students in the seminaries are on on peanuts wages, no, no one's getting uh, exorbitant money. You know what I mean? The, pretty much, if you're in the seminary, 
and you're not getting assistance from elsewhere, yep. you're doing it's it tough. It's very difficult. It's oh, you're doing difficult. it tough. Yep. Look, um, ju just to give you an idea, um, if you're there, like, and you're like in Lebanon, for example, I'll give you how Lebanon works. If you're there, you're married with children, okay, you're getting approximately, um, like you would say, about $150 a month around that kind of money, which is people that have lived in Lebanon will understand that's nothing. That's nothing. You wouldn't be able to live on it. Yep. So basically, I, I used to like have neighbours, okay, they'd make this spaghetti with no meat, you know, it'd be just like, yeah, yeah. Mm. And the, like, everything they'd buy, one of my neighbours, he would even buy, and this is, I'm not using any hyperbole here, he would go get the veggies that they were chucking out and uh, and he would get them and take whatever clean strips that were in them mm -hmm. from the grocers. Some of them, that's how they were living. Wow. They were doing it that tough. But for people to come around and say, hold on, how's it being used? Yes, but it's enough for them to live. Yeah. Enough for them to get by. If you want to do that extra yard, yeah. you know, you might save here so you can go and do with the money something else. So firstly, it's for strengthening religion mm -hmm. in terms of what's required. It's also for giving the poor, you know, helping the poor and the needy. And for example, one thing Samach the Sheikh didn't mention is Sayyid Sistani, in, in, this is exclusive to Iraq. It's not for any other country. It's exclusive if you are living in Iraq. He has given permission for you to give, if you are living in Iraq, yep. I'll repeat this. Yep. You have permission to use the Saham al Imam to give to poor people. If you know, if someone like next to you is in need and you know they're in need, he's giving you permission to use it there. But that's only for people that are exclusively living in Iraq. Yep. Yep. So they look at this, they see that the poverty is unbelievable in these regions and, and they give permission. So they look in terms of, like I said, number one, strength in religion. Uh, the, the whole procedure of the seminaries, mm. poor people, anything to do with the um, uh, with the religion as a whole. However, it's not used for the shrines. This is one thing people always mention. Mm -hmm. The shrines, like for example, these shrines are built by people. People come in and they put money in it and they have the shrine built. Someone will come in and say, listen, I want to change the dariq of the imam. How much money does it cost? I want to pay for it. Wow. It has nothing to do with the hummus whatsoever. None of the shrines have been built with hummus. Okay? And like I mentioned, the fuqahat themselves, they're not living good lives. They, I'm not, sorry, rich lives. Even their children. You're not, you don't go to um, Najaf and see Sayyid Muhammad Bakr Sistani driving a Range Rover. <laughs> like, seriously, that's not how they live. And people that go there will actually tell you, you see how they live. It's a very simple it's, life. It's, you see that the way that they're living yep. and their lives. And you didn't see, for example, all the other fuqaha, their children live in yep. these um, flashy yep. lives. Talking about the fuqaha and yep. the ma'atabarin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sheikh, um, I'll, I'll continue with you if you don't mind. Um, yeah, yeah. How does one calculate khums? If they, if they don't have any savings, if, for example, they're living, um, they're in, they're living, they're only able to sustain themselves through government benefits, or if they're a student, they're on a scholarship. Um, what do they? What should they do in that situation? Well, firstly, Sheikh Samah the Sheikh gave one system of the one of putting yeah. the hummus aside. The other system which is more generally given, is you are told to pick a day in the year, whether you use the Gregorian calendar or the Hijri calendar. You're allowed to use both. You know, with the Gregorian calendar, you gain a month every three years. So, but you're allowed to use either system. Now, you pick one day a year, for example, Samah Sheikh mentioned the 7th, 17th of June. Yeah. Now, how do we label who has and who doesn't? Say you're the cost of living for a married couple is $40,000 a year. I'm using hypothetically, okay? Say the cost of living... Where, where, where are you living for no. $40,000 a year? <laughs> $40,000, let's say someone's living in Wupu, they're paying $40,000 a year, and they earn 40000 
500. They're considered Islamically as rich because they earn more than their living expenses. Hmm. And if you earn 39,500, for example, you're considered as poor. Because you're earning less than that. You earn less. Yeah. Okay? So with these 39,500, I'm going to spend it all. At the end of the year, hmm. I won't have any hummus to pay. Hmm. But Sheikh mentioned several things a lot of people don't look at. We, you know, what we actually look at is our income. We don't look at um, stocks. We don't look at, uh, you know, our share market, yep. you know, portfolio or whatever yep. people have. We don't look at excess properties. Or, for example, excess cars. You have a Sunday car. That's not considered something that's a necessity. Hmm. If I just have a car to drive, even, and if we want to get into more details, people that build mansions. Yeah. Excessive rooms. Do, do you need ten rooms to pay in your house? On the excessive yeah. rooms. Yeah. If I buy items of clothing I don't wear, you know, they're all things I need to look at. But each one has its own rulings. Now, this is the easiest way to do it. You make a date. On that date, you. Samat Sheikh went over this. Yeah. I'm just going yeah. over it again. Sure. <laughs> you know, really, he really he, he actually gave it, it. What he said was pretty, like you know how he said to me. I don't know if you noticed. He said to add on if anything's missing. And it, the things that are missing are things that don't apply to you. That's what he says. So there's nothing he said didn't say that wasn't necessary. Hassan. What he said, pretty much, Samahto said that the income that you have, or the money that you have at the end of the, that year, you look at it, for example, I've got 5,000 he mentioned. Yeah. I pay 1,000 hummus, I'm left with 4,000. So I usually give the people I do it for, I give them a formula to, to work with. You know what I mean? But, I, you know, I've got to write it down because, if I, <laughs> because I, I use a lot of pronumals in it. But once you use this formula, so you, basically this $4,000, and Sheikh used the term khumst, yeah, <laughs> so this khumst term, $4,000, is yours for life. You know, you can do whatever you want with it. You know what I mean? You don't have to pay hummus on it again. The following year, say the following year, I have five thousand dollars, including the four thousand, a surplus. I only pay hummus on the one thousand because the four thousand I've already paid hummus. Yeah. So on that one thousand, I'm paying twenty percent of that, which is two hundred dollars. I'm left with eight hundred. So now I have four thousand eight hundred. Huh? That's hummus, as Samantha Sheikh said. <laughs> the following year, so I have another 5,000. How much will I have left now? 200. There's 4,800 I paid hummus on. So that 200 I paid hummus on, which is $40. I'm left with what? $160? Okay? So now I have 4,960. <laughs> Let's say the following year is 5,000. $40 I would have paid hummus on. Yep. Do you get what I mean? But here's a point that Samah Sheikh didn't mention. I don't, unless he did, I didn't hear him. Mm -hmm. But if the following year, say you have zero, that means you start from scratch again. Yep. Or say I have 3,000, 3,000 becomes my the, ras mail, the, the becomes baseline. my capital, becomes yep. the baseline. Yep. So that's how it works. Now, for other things the Sheikh mentioned, a lot of people don't look at things that he mentioned, like food and all that. I'll give you a trick. See all that stuff, buy it with the money you've already paid homes, you won't have a problem to <laughs> sit and calculate it. Otherwise, you're not going to, that way you don't need to sit and calculate that kind of stuff. But you don't need to use that yeah. for that because that money is going to be used for what? For See, I, things that you want. I, I think that's a really important point that this is not, this is not a tax. This is, this is a way to help support your belief and those who are less fortunate. Hajj, the thing is, let me tell you something. The thing is, you're not rich because of the sweat of your brow, mm -hmm. okay? Because mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you right now, there are some people that make um, uh, a killing out of the blue. Just money just pops in, uh, pops into their lap. Like this guy that when you when Hungry Jacks wanted to move over to Burger King, yep, and someone had owned the name Burger King, yep, so they needed to purchase the name off him. He sold it for $16 million yep. at that time. It was a long time ago. Yep. I'm talking about 30 years ago. $16 million. Like this guy had a burger shop. Yeah. 
that wouldn't be bought for 15 grand. He ended up with $16 million. How did he earn this? Raza, sustenance. So Allah Azza wa Jal, because he is the one that gives you this money, yeah. says you have to pay hummus on it. And it's not from the hard work. So how many um, fields do you see where someone does the same work as another person um, and someone makes it big and the other person doesn't? Yeah. So this is the whole system. The system Allah tests us through each other. Otherwise, where's, where's the test going to be? Yeah. Allah makes you think. And, and, and a good example here is two characters in the Quran. One is Qarun and the other one is um, Yusuf. Mm -hmm. But there's no comparison between the two. Qarun was a bad man. Yusuf was a prophet and a messenger of God. When they asked Qarun about his wealth, he says, I earned this from my knowledge that I have. My knowledge, my hard, you know, people say, you, from my hard work, I earned this. Whereas Yusuf says different. He says, Rabbi, he says, my Lord, you gave me. You know, you're the one that gave me. That's a difference. He recognizes where the source is from. Yeah. And that's why when you pay hummus, think of it like this. I've given you, so for example, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, I've given you 5,000. Now give me a thousand back. In other words, God's given you four thousand. You should be happy because you had nothing to start off with. You've been given something, and that's why we in Imam Zain al Abidin when he says, Khayruka ilayna nazil, dua bi hamza, wa sharruna ilayka sa'id. Allah Azza wa Jal gives us, and that's why I need to look at it. Allah is giving me 80%. I'm not paying 20%. I think that's a great way to look at it, yeah. Sheikh. That, um, no, and if I can go one step further, and I know we have one question, and then I have one. Uh, one question that I really want to ask from, from something that we've received and I think uh, time is getting on so we'll, we'll wrap it up in just a few minutes um, what I want to mention about that what you've said Sheikh is that if we look at it from the perspective that whatever we've got we're just a custodian of that it's not mine I didn't mm. like you said I didn't earn it it was given to me so mm. if, you got, if you look at it that if for my son for example when he's very young I might say we're going out to the shops or we're going something, look, just hold that $10 for me until I ask for it. Mm. And it's the same situation here. Here's your, here's your sustenance. Let me give you your sustenance, but what's left, I want some portion of it back. Yeah, but the problem is when you're asking your son, you know, where's that ten dollars? He turns around and says, "What ten dollars?" <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's what's happening these days. They say, what, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, um, we had a question. I know that you want to ask a question. Say, was there another question around there as well? Already answered. Oh, great! Thank you very much, um, brother. savings it's it's on surplus it's it's what's left of the money see at the end of your financial year whatever you have surplus see, it's what i have so i've used my year i've spent at the end of the year samah the sheikh mentioned if you do it say it's a nice system what he said but it's, it's if you do it like you could do it like you set it up say i earn 500 dollars a week and I set up an account that takes how much, takes $100 every week. Now, this account is like an offset account. Every time I might need money for my lively um, uh, living expenses, I take from this offset account. By the end of the year, whatever's in that offset account, I pay 20% of it. No, no, I pay 20% of it. Oh, okay. Do you know? Uh, sorry, it is, no, it's already 20%. Yeah. No, it's already 20%. Yeah. I pay it, yeah. yeah. It's already done because you've already, you've already, yeah, you've already done, done the hard done work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, look, it can it can be it can be a bit confusing. Um, yeah. it, it just getting your head around how to do the calculations and things, and that why mm. that's why we have Sheikh Muhammad and his formulas, and we have Sheikh Mansour available for consultation as well. Um, one last question, inshallah, and then we'll wrap up. But I really do think we need a second session where we can go into a bit more depth and detail. I think and we, if you're going to do it, I need, you need to do a workshop on this. It's different. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's different because yeah. it's it's hard for, like when Sheikh Mansour was speaking, yeah. it's easier for me to absorb it. Yeah. 
but someone that doesn't have, and a lot of the people that understand the Khums mm -hmm. concept, they absorbed what he was saying. Yeah. Uh, other people that don't understand the concept, mm. it, it's honestly, difficult. you yeah. don't understand. Yeah. You know, because any time like fiqh, fiqh in general is hard to absorb. Yeah. It's not a fun subject. Yeah. <laughs> Ask any lawyer. You know? um, um, Sheikh Mansour, if I can, if I can post this question to you, um, sure. let's say I have. Uh, it might not be an easy answer, and, and you might want to defer uh, answering this, but I, I, I think it's important to ask. Let's say I have some existing debt. Uh, it could be credit card debt, I have an existing mortgage, uh, and I have income throughout the year. Uh, on my home state, I have $1,000 left, but I still have maybe $5,000 in debt, uh, whether it's credit card or mortgage, or you know, inshallah, everybody only has a $5,000 mortgage. But, does one offset the other, or is it just that, okay, well, you still have a thousand dollars, that has to be, um, uh, applies to that no matter what? Yes, very good and very common question, uh, Hajali. Uh, basically, anyone has homes is on someone who has saving, and saving it means that we have covered your expenses, including your debts. So if you have a debt, yeah, you don't need to pay the homes, given that you will spend your, your saving against your uh, your debt. So if the debt is immediate that I have to pay it now, obviously I will pay it. But according to Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Sistani has a, a, a special fatwa here. He says that if you have a mortgage, for example, as in a typical example of a debt, and uh, the mortgage is, you don't have to pay all of it. Let's say you've got the mortgage for $500,000. Your income this year is like what Sheikh mentioned, 40,000. So, uh, and you saved about, I don't know, 10,000 of it, 10,000 again, 500,000. You don't need to pay the homes of 10,000 because you've got a mortgage. Even though the mortgage is not, not all 500 is due now, it's due for the coming years, but you can put it against your mortgage to pay it even next years or so, and therefore you're exempt from the homes. Sheikhna, just I wanted to add to that. Please. It's as long as the 10,000 is for the mortgage. You can't put it aside then put new mag wheels on your car. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 100%. Yeah, that's, that's why I wanted course, to make definitely. sure. That's what I mean. Just in case someone yes, runs yes. off with it, yeah. Of course. If, they, if I don't spend it for my mortgage and I keep it aside like what Sheikh said to spend it on something else or, or just saving for the sake of saving, of course there is still homes due on it. Sam, thank you very much. I'm glad you clarified that. That we, I was going to ask you that, okay, well, suddenly I'll take a big debt and uh, keep yeah. my homes. <laughs> yeah. The best way that we suggest, Fajali, for this situation is that put that saving into your offset account for your mortgage. You know, usually there is an offset account for the mortgage. If you put it on your offset account, because in the offset account, it will reduce your mortgage interest or, or money that you have to pay. And at the same time, there is no homes on it. However, at the end of your, uh, your mortgage, when your mortgage has been cleared, anything that is left in the offset account needs to be homes. That means that was extra. Yeah, right. just also. Yes, Sheikh. This is exclusive to Sayyid Sistani. What's the Sheikh saying? Sec secondly, yes. this is exclusive to the home that you live in. Yes. This not isn't your, for not an your investment third investment property. property yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Just, yeah, yeah, not investment. This sorry, is for I had to just clarify because sometimes yeah. you might say. No, but I cannot say, Ahsan. Yes, yes. No, sometimes we become uh, yeah. uh, oblivious of. Yes, that's for the living expenses. Yeah. Excellent. Living home. Thank and you so much, Sheikh. Car. Thank yeah. you also for mentioning about the offset account. I did want, there was a question about that. And I'm glad you mentioned that. I thought it might get too complicated. So I left it out for this Plus, discussion. This, Haj Ali, the problem, and people. The problem with the offset account, there's follow-up questions. Because people keep an offset account, but they don't see. If I'm putting the money in the offset account, but I'm because people put an offset account to reduce the interest, the interest rate. Yeah. So if I'm putting the offset account just for that purpose, I have to pay homeless on it. But if I'm putting it there and I'm paying the rate at the... But that's what the money is exclusively for. Then you have no homeless. But if I put it in the offset account, I'm going to use it for other things. Then I have to pay homeless on it. That's what this is okay. And this is why it's very difficult. That's why I tell people to pay homeless on it. Because if they play around with it, they're going to have big money owing to them that they don't know about. Yeah. Owing, yeah. sorry, on and, them. And at the end of the day, you're, you're not taking the money from 
anybody else. You're taking it away from, from God. Mm. And he's the one who provides the sustenance. Mm. So if you're going to do Son. questionable uh, things, then uh, the source of your risen and your revenue and your income and everything, you're putting that in doubt. Not that he won't give you, but you, you know, maybe doing the wrong thing. Um, Sheikh Mansour and Sheikh Muhammad, thank you very much. Inshallah, it does seem like a, a, a second discussion, and as Sheikh Muhammad mentioned, a, a, a workshop, workshop session would be really valuable, and inshallah, we'll get some feedback from everybody here and, and online as well. Uh, and we will, inshallah, organize that for the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Sheikh Muhammad and Sheikh Mansour, and thank you for your valuable insights. Really do appreciate it, and inshallah, we will see you again soon. Uh, just a quick reminder that next week there is no Friday night program. Other programs will continue as usual. And here on Friday night, we will see you in two weeks' time, inshallah. Thank you very much, and please bless this um, gathering with a salawat. Uh, before that, a quick uh, announcement and a quick reminder. From this coming Thursday, inshallah, on Thursday evenings before Dua Kumail, we will begin a session of Tafsir of Quran. Uh, we're beginning with Tafsir of uh, Surah Al-Hamd, and this will be led by Sheikh Muhammad Dehnawi. Uh, if you haven't met Sheikh Dehnawi, you're missing out. Take this opportunity to, um, to be a part of that program. Is there an advertisement for it? There is. There's, there's a, a lot of people asking, but this is very important. Sorry, I didn't want please. to cut you off, no, but this please, Tafsir of Quran, a lot of people ask about this, and uh, Sheikh Muhammad Dehnawi, the people I've met him, is someone that teaches the Quran, is a reciter of the Quran, yes. and he understands the Quran. But just for, I wanted to really specify this. If you sit, one of the best things you can do is to understand the Quran. And one of the best things for you to understand. So if these are, are they available, what nights are they? Thursday evening from 7.30 yeah. p.m. And then followed by recitation of Dua Kumail. MashaAllah, that's good. So inshallah from 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays you can join us as well. As Sheikh Muhammad mentioned, very, very valuable. And inshallah we will see you then. It is going to be in person only. So you need to be here at the center to take full advantage of this program. Uh, this will not be online. But so uh, for those of you who live locally, that's a great advantage. For those of you who don't, sorry. <laughs> um, Will it be recorded? We will have to ask the coordinator of that program to see if it will be recorded. Thank you for asking, though. Uh, do we have uh, Dua Faraj with our young man coming up? Yes. Okay, terrific. Come on up. Come on up. Let's do Dua Faraj. Uh, do you have the mic, Ahmad? Come on up. Okay, it's all right. We'll use this mic. It's fine. Go ahead, please. Allah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kulli waliyaka hujjati ibn al Hassan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala awa'i fi hadhi al sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a. Waliyan wa hafidha wa qa'idhan wa nasira wa dalilan wa ayna. حتى تسكنه وأرذك طوعا فاتمته فيها طويلة برحمتك يا أرحم راحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد واجد فرجهم